look back over the, over the past year, I think I've only had one other opportunity to wear a collared shirt. So that's pretty exciting for me and very exciting for my dry cleaner who, you know, used to rely almost exclusively on income from our family. But here we are now, we are residing in a post dry cleaner world. And I'm not sure if it's a good place or not, certainly not for the dry cleaner. But I digress. Um, I have a, a talk arranged for everyone today. And I'm very excited to be here, as I mentioned before, talking about healthcare funding and healthcare policy. So some of the unique challenges faced by Canadians are illustrated by this map, which is a population density map of Canada and Canada's provinces and territories. And right off the bat, you can imagine the challenges associated with delivering healthcare across this vast and largely unpopulated or sparsely populated area and how to do so efficiently, effectively and cost efficiently as well too many significant challenges associated with doing that. So where does Canada stand in terms of its spending on healthcare? I pulled this off the um, OECD website and also some input from the Canadian Institute from Health Information. I know it's a, a couple of years old, but notwithstanding the results are still the same today. Canada is usually in the top 10 spenders on healthcare in the entire world. So I just want to put the rest, any uh, misperceptions you have that Canadian governments and uh, Canadians in general do not spend on healthcare. That is absolutely not the case. In terms of OECD countries, we're always in the top 10 and we spend a uh, literal fortune on healthcare. And we're right up there with the wealthiest nations as well too. So some statistics that I updated over the last few days, we are now north of $250 million billion per year on healthcare. And that equates to over $7,000 Canadian um, per, on a per capita basis. And that is just a, a massive amount. And it represents over 11% of our economy. Um, I pulled that off the Stats Canada and the Canadian Institute for Health Information's uh, websites. So of the $265 billion that Canadians are spending on healthcare, about 70% of that is public funding. So that would be the provinces and territories, ministries of health, and also Health Canada in terms of services and programs for Canadians. So 70% of that is public spending, the rest is private. Um, or, or some of it's commercial, but that's still deemed to be private as well too. So we're at a, a point of inflection right now where healthcare spending is getting dangerously close to 50% of provinces and territories, provincial governments. So that is just an astronomical thing to consider if you think that half of all dollars gained through taxation are spent on healthcare and it is crowding out other ministries of health. So should you ever wonder why provincial ministries of health are forever warring with teachers over salaries, we can thank healthcare for that because they are the second largest uh, source of expenditures and natural target for uh, healthcare spending growth. So next, although this is a couple of years old, I would like to draw attention to the interprovincial variation on spending on hospitals because it's a good launching point for the rest of the talk. Because what we see here is that Ontario is a very efficient, cost-efficient provider of hospital-based care compared with Quebec, which is you know quite similar, albeit in Quebec, their wage rates for RNs, uh, registered nurses are quite a bit lower than most other provinces. And then if you shift to the West, you can see in Alberta for the same kind of hospital-based care, we're about 20% higher in the per capita hospital spending. Um, so this is just a massive amount of variation and how much gets spent on healthcare depends on where you live. In Alberta, for example, the difference in the high rate of spending on healthcare is associated with very large uh, relative wage rates for nurses, allied health professionals, and physicians compared to other provinces driving their expenditures. So this is a bit of my perception of the Canadian uh, healthcare delivery system. Um, uh, sorry to borrow too much from the Prairie Provinces, but it is sector-based and I, I call them silos because they are hardened silos that have delivery systems within each sector. 
there is a hospital system uh, sector, there is a home care sector, there is a drug sector, there is a physician services sector, and they are not very good at being integrated to think uh, person, person centered or a cross continuum of care. These sectors have been around for a long time and they've had a lot of time to harden essentially. Moreover, one of the challenging concepts associated with changing the delivery of healthcare is that governments themselves are organized into these silos. There's a physician services branch. Um, there is a drug branch. There's a hospitals branch. There's a home care branch. So there's a long-term care. And in the case of Ontario, there's a whole ministry for long-term care. So my perceptions of the delivery system is set up by these silos. Um, reflecting how hospitals are paid, um, with the possible exception of on the margin in Ontario, most hospitals in Canada are funded with what is known as a global budget. A global budget is a fixed sum of funding paid to the hospital for a year to provide services to their community. So within this context of this envelope of funding provided by the Ministry of Health, or depending on what province you're actually in, it could also be your local health integration network, it could be the health authority, in British Columbia, it's the health authority, for example. There's a single budget for the hospitals, and they, they are not aligned with uh, linking services with the community care sector. There's no incentive to increasing access because increasing access increased costs and they don't get a bump up for providing services to more patients. And there's no bump up for associated higher quality and or safer kind of care. So why do governments have global budgets? Well, they're pretty predictable and they can build them into the um, budgets uh, very suitably and um, they have been around for over 40 years in Canada and that's how Canadian ministries of health pay for their hospitals. Um, one of the arguments in the last 10 years has been that global budgets are very effective at controlling costs but in my position and pulling out the Canadian Institute for Health Information national health expenditures files is that hospital budgets have increased over 5% per year for the last decade. So I would say global budgets are even failing at controlling costs in any sense of the word that we would think of. Now, physician payment, fee-for-service payment based on fee schedules. This is the predominant form of remunerating physicians across the country in the different provinces and territories. Interestingly enough, and this may shock many of you on this call, but most regional health authorities in the hospitals have no visibility what, what physicians' billings are like. So within their catchment area are the, re, are the regions where they draw their patients from in the hospitals. The hospitals have no idea what the physicians are doing. Nor, moreover, there's no alignment with the hospital's mission or the region's priorities. The, hospital, the physicians can essentially just keep on billing. Now, this isn't a physician's fault, this is just the mechanism and the policies used to remunerate physicians and they're unaligned with the other sectors of care. Now that we move on to the other punching bags and the first one is long-term care, often the popular media these days because of so many um, uh, excess deaths associated with the COVID pandemic, but the way that long-term care is paid on a per bed per day or on a global budget. So that is a lump sum for operating for a year. So that is the incentive for these long-term care operators to have the lowest cost patients in the revenue associated with that bed. So the least costly residents. And complicating the long-term care sector is the fact that it's not part of the Canada Health Act, so that uh, services are provided by a mix of private for-profit, not-for-profit and publicly owned providers, each with their own take on their community's mission for providing long-term care to their communities. Also in home care, these are fee-for-service payments, uh, mostly like physician-based payments. There's an incentive to do more when remunerated on a per volume case, but it's out unrelated to patients' outcomes, their satisfaction, expectations, or slowing functional decline. 
Moreover, within each of these silos, there's no incentive for sector substitutions. So there's no incentive to move patients to long-term care from the hospital, causing one of the, or one of the most common uh, sequelae of that is that we have a lot of patients in hospital called ALC, alternative level of care, uh, or bed blockers, as one say, would say. So what is the value from all of these silos here? Right now, you know, I'm pulling from the Commonwealth Fund and I looked at the, uh, the most recent stats from the Canadian Institute for Health Information and the uh, Commonwealth Fund over the past few years to synthesize that Canada is doing really poorly when we compare ourselves with the 12 other OECD countries included in the Commonwealth Fund annual survey. So we're not getting great value. We're certainly not underspending. So I think the work that IHI does to drive value to improve health outcomes is critically important for charting the path for, for healthcare in Canada. Now I'm gonna leave people with a few examples here of what variation looks for and some targets for potential interventions. So until COVID hit, I actually was the provincial lead of the value for money program in Ontario, where it was co-funded by the Ministry of Health and also Cancer Care Ontario, now called Ontario Health, where my role was to provide recommendations with uh, regarding inter and intra sectoral investments. So that is where are we gonna get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of new healthcare spending in terms of patients' health? So we started to have a look around to say, well, what kind of health are we getting now and where are we getting health and where should we intervene? So on this dot plot, each of the circles represents uh, an acute care hospital in Ontario that provides colorectal cancer surgery for colorectal patients, uh, colorectal cancer patients. And as you see, the largest hospitals are those cases that are doing the most case, uh, cases per year generally send about 20% of their patients to the ICUs. And then we're looking at this plot and we're like, okay, there's, there are a, a number of smaller community hospitals, moderate and small community hospitals with about one or two cases a week that are sending between 60 to 80% of their patients after colorectal surgery to intensive care. Now these are case mix adjusted results. So that is we're adjusting for patients morbidity, pre-existing morbidities. And the difference are very meaningful because the cost to send a patient to the ICU is triple the rate that it is for a general inpatient ward bed. So we're like, what's going on up here? And it turns out when we phone up these hospitals and they're not reluctant to sort of talk about their hospital practices that cause 80% of their patients to be sent to the ICU, is that they're saying, well, we need to keep the anesthesiologist or the intensivist fully employed. So we need to keep our ICU uh, full all, all the time. And our surgeon doesn't want to get called over the weekend and at nights. So it's our practices on the clinical pathway to put all patients in the ICU and then pick them up in the morning. So we see some hospital practices unrelated to the patient's outcomes are really driving the discharge location and hence provincial spending on a number of cases. Now this is the same sort of a, a plot where we're looking at uh, patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder and they're hospitalized in it, for it. So they're case mix adjusted. So we're adjusting for all of the morbidities of the patient and we should hopefully like to see everyone around a standard rate. But here we see patients are our hospitals, each circle is a hospital ranging from 10 to about 30 in the biggest hospitals. And these are for factors unrelated to the patient. So there are hospital practices is at play, availability of beds, a lot of other factors driving where patients are going to the ICU, which are triple the cost that we see in the general inpatient bed. And it's not just Ontario. I mean, I had that data available, so I thought I'd share it with, uh, with you today, but it's also true in British Columbia. Here we're looking at uh, nasal septum reconstruction rates adjusted for age and sex and morbidity across the province. And it turns out that if you live in Kamloops, you have excellent access to an outpatient surgery to have your nasal septum repaired. 
if you're elsewhere in the province, uh, shown by these different uh, shades of color, you have a lot poorer access and longer wait times. So what is it that's driving the expedited access versus the slower access in some of these other regions of the province? And supports the hypothesis around where you live drives the kind of care that you receive. Here's another example that I draw from Ontario. This is the uh, variation in home care following uh, uh, mastectomy. So these women have had a mastectomy to treat their breast cancer and often home care comes to check their wounds at home within, uh, within the next few days after being discharged. And what we see is very significant variation in terms of the patient's care pathway and their receipt of home care at home to check their wounds. So clearly this is not unrelated to uh, re-hospitalization uh, re rates. If someone ha potentially has a reinfection and no one's come to help them, guide them on how to look after their wounded hair uh, at home. Um, if there is someone at home, making sure that they are functional at their place of residence, all of these factors play a role in the kind of variation we see here, which is shocking. Here's some work that I, I did in the long-term care sector in the province of Alberta. So here we have each dot being one uh, hospital in Alberta. And these are all patients that are discharged alive from hospital with COPD or congestive heart failure. And here it is a relative rate of being put into a long-term care home following receipt of hospital-based care. So you can see quite easily that the majority of hospitals don't send their patients to a long-term care facility. But you do see a number of hospitals here sending their patients at an alarming rate. And these are case mix adjusted. So that means we're adjusting for the morbidity burden of the patient into long-term care. And again, supports the hypothesis, depending on where you live, will have a large role in where you are sent next. This is a bit of a busy slide, but it also illustrates a really important uh, point around uh, these are elective knee replacements in two local health integration networks in, in Ontario. One is the Southeast and one is the Central. And what you see is actually the hospital-based costs are very similar. They have very similar re-hospitalization rates within 30 days. So readmission rates, an indicator of poor quality in some cases. But then you see where patients are discharged too. So you see in the Southeast where there aren't many or any specialized rehabilitation hospitals, less than 7% of the patients following an elective knee replacement are sent to an inpatient rehabilitation hospital like TRI, Toronto Rehab. But if you're in uh, central, uh, on in the central limb, over half of the patients following an elective knee replacement are sent into inpatient rehabilitation. And you can imagine that that cost drives the, the cost of the episode of care. So you can see that there is about a 25% variability in terms of the joint replacements, episode of care costs across all sectors. It's really quite a striking difference. And that is because in central Toronto, what you see are we have these inpatient rehabilitation hospitals. There's several of them. So the natural care pathway for people having elective knee and hip replacements in Toronto is the following discharge from hospital to be admitted into one of these specialty hospitals. Whereas if you live elsewhere in the province, that doesn't happen. So it spurs this whole industry associated what is value in healthcare. And if you sort of drill it down to the work that came out of uh, Porter and Ticeberg seminal work, it is achieving high value for patients must become the overarching goal of healthcare delivery. And value in healthcare defined as the health outcomes achieved per dollar spent. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time just talking about this. Um, and I have some surgical outcomes here for British Columbia. So these are patients hospitalized for a non-complex hernia repair. So a simple hernia, inguinal hernia. And what we see here is on the vertical scale, we have their preoperative health. And on the right-hand side, we have their post-operative health. So we see that for almost 50% of the inguinal hernia repair patients, only 50% of them experience a better improvement in their quality 
of life following their surgery. However, those patients that reported the worst quality of life, they experience fairly significant gains in terms of patient's health. So certainly a less than a, a fulsome gain in health. So if you were to advise the minister on health, where to achieve good bank for your buck in terms of health spending, would non-complex -com hernia repair be your first stop? I'm not so sure about that. Secondly, we have uh, um, sinus interventions. And this is filled with, and this is a very common procedure, it's called an endoscopic sinus surgery for the treatment of chronic sinusitis. And this prevents people, it's a, it occurs to some degree in about one out of 10 people. It uh, inhibits their sleep, what can trigger depression and all sorts of uh, mental health conditions. So um, hospitals in all urban centers have very busy ENT clinics associated with endoscopic sinus surgery for this treatment of a chronic condition. And what we've shown on the left-hand panel is that you get some patients who have very, very poor quality of life associated with a condition, experience very large gains in terms of this condition. But we also have 25% of the patients having this minor surgery experience literally no change in their quality of life. Now, the problem is that for specialty care in hospitals that they can't distinguish who's gonna experience the biggest gain in health, so they treat everyone equally. Now, on the right-hand side of this plot, we have a scatter plot of a sample of patients who had this surgery and correlated it with wait times. And what we found was that patients wait time, and it is generally between 30 to 40 weeks for endoscopic sinus surgery in province of British Columbia, which is over six months to get to surgery. There was no association with wait time and their clinical or functional outcomes. So it also pushes the hot button issue, are wait times important to everyone and or everyone? Because for some like orthopedic conditions and cataract surgery, yeah, wait times are really important. And there's a big, uh, big base of evidence upon which to make that determination. But for other less popular sur surgeries, I mean, they are popular for the people who have them, the wait times has no role in, uh, um, undermining their long-term surgical outcomes and the effectiveness of the surgery. And here's another one that shows that actually not everyone even gets better. So on the left-hand side, it's the preoperative health and quality of life. And on the right-hand side is their preoperative or their post-operative outcomes. For colostomy patients, you see that, you know, about half of the patients at best get better and about half experience some functional decline associated with their underlying condition. However, if I bring up this slide, because we also measured their pain, we had for those patients that are experiencing significant pain associated with their condition, maybe it's irritable bowel or Crohn's or some other chronic condition like that, they experience significant pain relief. So it is important to think about value in terms of not only what kind of health or, or health that you're getting in terms of the health services you're providing, but what kind of health you're generating for patients. It might be pain, but it might also be alleviating the cause of their depression as well too. So value can take many different forms depending on the, uh, the uh, health con condition one is looking at. Now here's an interesting one. This is a common surgery, um, unfortunately too common for people with end stage ankle arthritis. So that is very serious uh, joint deterioration of the ankle after they've tried steroids and all other forms of uh, non-surgical interventions. They're left facing what is called an ankle replacement or an ankle surgery, a fairly significant three day length to stay in hospital where they either fuse your ankle and or uh, put in a, a, a new joint there. And we have on the scatter plot on the left-hand side, we have their depression and pain scales of these patients preoperatively. So you can imagine then in the right-hand quadrant, the upper right, those are patients with high pain and high depression, uh, meeting the clinical thresholds for being treated for pain and or being treated for depression. So the objective of the surgery is to try to drive patients down into the lower left-hand quadrant where it's associated with less pain and less severe symptoms associated with depression. And here's the post-op look at it. We can definitely tell 
that the density, each little dot represents a sample or a patient from a sample of patients. The density in the lower left-hand quadrant has definitely gone down. So this suggests that the, the surgery is very effective at relieving pain and depression for a good number of patients, but we still see postoperatively, and this is six to 12 months following their surgery, a lot of patients still have meaningful levels of pain and depression. So it doesn't fix everyone. And the problem is that you don't know preoperatively who's going to improve and who's not, which makes the value proposition a lot more challenging. Now, here are the tables from two recent publications of my students and my team that I've led here that looks at, and this is the value equation, and looking at the gain in health or the quality adjusted life years via V the cost of providing the surgery. So this is the hospital born cost and the um, surgeon and anesthesiologist cost. And what you see, the cost per quality adjusted life year vary significant across the different age categories. So what you see is for patients that are 70 and above, the cost per quality adjusted life year is very, very high, you know, three or five times higher than the younger patients. So that drives the question about, well, who should be prioritized for surgery? Would you go for the most cost effective, which would be the, um, would be the youngest because the cost per quality improve the quality, health-related quality of life of the oldest patients. And as we draw an analog to the COVID uh, and to COVID vaccination rollout and treating the most vulnerable, the analogy, analogy here would be maybe those patients who have the fewest life years left should be expedited into the surgical queue to uh, optimize their health in their remaining years versus the younger patients who have a much longer expected lifespan. And this is a, a quick comparison of eight different inpatient and outpatient surgeries. And I apologize for the fact that I've been doing a lot of work in surgery over the last few years, but it gives you a sense of how many patients are improving um, uh, attributable to their surgeries. So each of the different kinds of surgeries like a hysterectomy for bleeding and or pain, non-cancer related, 60% um, of them improve in their health status, and but only about 40 of them um, improve to the level that they say it's a meaningful, the, the exceed, their gain in health exceeds the minimally important difference. So these are really interesting variations to talk about. Well, if you're going to maximize health, when you're faced with these kind of statistics, as a government funder and or a healthcare provider, where do you put your effort and investment? And I don't have the answers for that, but it is illustrating to really draw out this evidence to say that there are variable outputs associated with healthcare spending across the provinces and the different silos. So coming back to the value equation, you know, the work by Porter and Ticework was really important because it drew needed attention to the equation of value and health means. And they drew a number of really important constructs, uh, seven of them enumerated here. It's not just uh, for patients or value for the patients, uh, not just to focus on spending, consider the full episode of care, However, healthcare providers should have unrestricted competition based on their results. So that means that patients should have, you know, um, a free hand in choosing their healthcare provider to get what they feel is the best outcomes and so on and so forth uh, on through these seven. However, it, it's not, and this may be true in the United States, um, those principles for achieving higher value in healthcare, it doesn't translate as readily into the Canadian healthcare system. Because first, um, you know, we do not have providers competing for the government's or insurer's dollars uh, or for patients. So they're not competing on outcomes or reducing costs as they would be in the United States and several other insurance-based market. Um, most uh, specialty providers have very long queues and they don't feel they're competing with one another. Um, there's no information on results and prices available in Canada. So you don't know what your hospital costs, the taxpayer or the Ministry of Health, um, nor whether or not they're high quality or low quality. And nor, moreover, there's very little competition at the sort of the, the 
interregional level because the statistics that would support comparisons are largely um, very challenging to obtain or, or impossible to obtain. So I like to come back to think about, well, who derives value from healthcare in Canada's provinces and territories? Well, we all naturally think of patients, uh, that much is clue, uh, clear, and we're trying to work towards extending survival of treatments, improving function and overall health related quality of life, there's no doubt. But there's, we, we also have a lot of work to do to be responsive to their preferences in terms of their convenience of accessing care, where they uh, wanna access care, their expectations for their outcomes um, and outcomes that they feel and their caregivers feel are important to the patients. But there's a whole other silo associated with what is value to individual providers, like a physician who runs their own business and provider organizations like hospitals or long-term care homes. Clearly there's income associated with the provision of health services. There's full-time employment or part-time employment. Other aspects that are important might be the organizational culture that's um, within these institutions and or practices. There's peer recognition in that their peers think they provide high quality and effective care um, and or technical expertise in the term, uh, in the case of surgeons, for example. The third uh, sort of group that we have to think about when we think about value from healthcare is the system level or the societal level. And this is often a proxy for governments and uh, ministries of health. And that is university, uh, universality of access and access to what? Like drugs and home care, long-term care. A lot of that is not covered under the Canada Health Act. Health of the population, all provinces and territories would love to improve health outcomes at the population level, population health outcomes. Um, but the system level, they're also thinking they want a resilient and robust delivery system that's capable of learning and incorporating new clinical evidence and research as it becomes available and changes practices as that evidence becomes available. But from the government payers perspective, they equally want the delivery system and the different providers and organizations within it to be cost efficient and effective. They don't want the provision of ineffective care or useless drugs or imaging, but they, and they want hospitals to operate it cost efficiently. So there are a lot of different things and objectives from the healthcare that are really important to the delivery system and are not just patient focused because there's the providers and also the payers perspectives. So uh, reflecting on my body of work that I do in healthcare funding and healthcare funding policy is that is right now there is a clear, and this is not contingent upon COVID. I mean, this has been true at least for the last decade and a decade and a half. Now the governments and the ministries of health do not provide a clear sense or a clarity regarding for what they would like from their healthcare funding. So how do they improve patients, providers, and a health system value for the billions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars that they pour in? Um, some countries and healthcare delivery systems, and I'll draw from some American examples here, have a good sense of what high value healthcare doesn't look like. So for example, um, hospital acquired conditions, those uh, conditions that uh, occurred during a hospitalization, and that could be a post-operative infection, it could be a fall, it could be a wrong uh, type of infusion, it could be any of those. And they're not paying hospitals for poor quality anymore or for related uh, readmissions. So that is if they let you go home when they shouldn't have too early and you have post-operative complications, you have to come back. In some insurance markets, they're not paying hospitals for that poor quality care that originated in the hospitals. There's also the whole body of valuable work from the Choosing Wisely campaign in that there's a strong body of evidence that shows that some tests or images are ineffective for treating some clinical conditions. Yet we still pay for them in Canadian provinces and territories. There's been no association between the Choosing Wisely campaign's list of ineffective care and uh, physician remuneration and or hospital budgets. So um, 
other systems are making these choices and saying, we don't wanna pay for what we know is low, va low value care. So my recommendation is that we try to uh, align healthcare funding policy with what we think we want from the healthcare delivery system. We want no complications. We don't want readmissions um, and we want high value care if we can figure out what that looks like for patients, healthcare providers and organizations and for the government. So I do a fair amount of international work comparing countries, delivery systems and healthcare funding policies. And what I can tell you so far is there's no silver bullet for improving the value from healthcare or healthcare spending yet. Um, no country seemed to have the magic elixir to say, this is what high value care is for us, for patients and caregivers, for healthcare providers, and then for the um, public funders, the taxpayers. So it's probably going to be some balance between patients and caregivers outcomes, which are health outcomes, experiences, what patients and caregivers want from their care, which is say minimizing out of pocket costs, convenient access, minimal wait times, uh, good communication with my physician. All of those attributes are probably really important but also from the perspective of provider organizations. You know, hospitals have reputations they worry about. They want to be recognized for their peer, for their delivery, high quality delivery systems, um, em employment of uh, nurses, allied health professionals, porters across the spectrum, uh, healthcare providers or major employers across Canada but that hospitals also want their staff to be engaged. They want them to be satisfied and not have experience high turnover. They also want to reduce inefficiencies so that they can demonstrate to the payer that they're cost effective. Now, on the other hand, we have the government. Um, they try to balance between sector cost efficient spending. They don't know exactly how to do that because it's not clear on where to spend money to get bang for uh, the taxpayer's health. Uh, governments also want uh, a skill mix. So they want to uh, align their university's training programs with what the delivery system in the future is going to look like. So that drives some investments in universities to medical school spots and nursing school spots. Um, so what's the suitable infrastructure, including uh, health IT infrastructure? And the, the health system is capable in, of engaging with the providers that work at them and the patients and caregivers that receive care from them. And I'll return to the point that governments are built and organized on these same silos. So as we want cross continuum of care, that means that our care is managed across no matter what sector and what provider, and it's paid for to get the, to get the health care that we want and expect. Um, you know, governments are not aligned there. I know in British Columbia, they've recently hived off mental health care into its own ministry and making it harder to, you know, reconcile health care delivery for mental health conditions from physical health uh, conditions. In Ontario, they've recently split uh, the Ministry of Long-Term Care from the Ministry of Health Care. That's making it a little bit more challenging because now you have to work across different ministries to be able to optimize patients' care. So governments themselves are trying, are, are taking steps to what they see as clarify roles and responsibilities and mandates, but making it harder for people to work within those silos to optimize patients and caregivers care. So my last slide here is to encourage, I know there are a good number of students here today and I'm grateful for that. I hardly saw any names that I recognized as people rolled in, which is wonderful. Um, is to look for value from each level and not just the patient level because provider and provider organizations are equally critical and they drive a lot of value from the healthcare system. And you can also take perspective from the government in terms of where are you gonna get the most value for your bang for your buck? And think about in incentives across the sectors to get healthcare providers and the healthcare organizations to work together to optimize patients' health. So my own work is associated with developing and thinking about healthcare funding policies that align with improving value. So how do you get cost efficiency within and between sectors and how to get the healthcare organizations to play nicely together? What new streams of data do we need to add to get to a better place in terms of providing value to healthcare providers? 
And my personal favorite these days is that we need to measure health outcomes more consistently uh, for all patients receiving care. So we understand what health is, or each individual's health, a constellation of health symptoms, just not physical health with symptoms, but also mental health, depression, anxiety, pain, all of those, and understand and uh, sort of align treatments uh, with their health objectives. And also to think about how do you spend, how does one, in terms of provider organization and government funding, spend money to maximize health? Now, that is not something that's often done because there's many competing priorities going to the Ministry of Health saying this will improve our patients' lives. Yes, it probably will. But as the government with the limited purse strings or, or limited financial resources, where do you spend it to get all of the things that you're seeking. And this is really challenging and hopefully will challenge you through your academic life to think about how do I spend this to get what everyone wants here. There are pockets of strength that includes some of the rigorous evaluation around health technology assessment where they've been very effective at looking at the costs and the benefits associated with new drugs and devices that are entering the market. But it's my opinion that we need to broaden this type of measurement rigor to other sectors and healthcare services to understand whether or not we're getting value from a broader part of the healthcare system that patients and their families and healthcare providers and organizations want. So with that, I, I thank you very much for attending today. I'm very excited to have been here and share my perspectives on Canada's delivery system. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sutherland. That was a very interesting and engaging presentation. Um, it doesn't seem like, oh, I have a question in the chat here. So I thought there were no questions, but um, one question just rolled in before I give you all of my questions. Um, so what are your thoughts, so Conrad, so it says, what are your thoughts on bundled, bundled maybe payment models for healthcare services, assuming that the bundled payment is adjusted for the patient's initial health status? Yeah, as people that follow some of my work will know that I've been very engaged in designing bundled payments. Um, and first, I spent a few years in the United States at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation when the Affordable Care Act was implemented, which supported at a population level for Medicare in the United States, the implementation of bundled payments, which is a single aggregated payment for a patient's condition, irrespective of where they receive care and irrespective of who provides that care. So that could be the hospital, a home care, different physicians and surgeons. So I've been very supportive and working with the province of Ontario to help design um, the parameters around what bundled payments could and should look like. Now, as an, as an advisor, I only provide advice on those, but I think that bundled payments are a very important step to get the silos to talk to one another, um, the healthcare silos, the delivery system, because right now there's a lack of financial incentives for the different providers. And I'm not just blaming physicians here, I'm saying all healthcare providers, including healthcare organizations, have no incentives to work effectively together. So bundled payment is one such mechanism whereby they are forced or they are, there are incentives created for them to work together. So I'm quite optimistic that this will be a first step in a weakening of the silos to get the sectors to talk to one another. Great, uh, thank you. I didn't even know what bundled payments were, so that was very helpful to, to understand that. Um, I have a question regarding, you mentioned incentives. I know perhaps maybe it's not true, but there are incentives in the States for quality, such as penalties for rising hospital readmissions and that sort of thing. And I think there's been some talk about whether or not that would work or whether it's a good idea. And how do you feel about that in, in terms of Canadian, the Canadian healthcare system? Yeah, and, and it's not just the United States. I mean, hospitals, uh, are receiving penalties for related readmissions or adverse events in hospital, um, just after the hospitalizations in England, Germany, and oh, there's another Nordic country. 
Um, so there are now a number of countries whereby the hospital receives either a holdback or some sort of disincentive for not providing effective hospital-based care. Um, the efficacy with which these policies have been um, working or their ability to um, reduce readmission rates, it has been, has been associated with positive outcomes in the United States. For these other countries, the evidence is still a little bit nascent in that it's still maturing. We don't have clear guidelines. With regard to its possibility here in Canada, certainly it's po anything's possible. Um, whether or not it would be effective or not with global budgets, I'm not so clear on because global budgets are single payment to hospitals to provide care to all the residents in the community for a year. So if we're gonna penalize hospital for poor quality care or readmissions or adverse events, we are possibly de-linking it with a bundle or, or with a global budget from the actual care that was poor quality. So unless there's funding attached to each patient, the hospitals don't really get a sense until the financial um, reconciliation quarterly happens. So I'm a little less certain that it is going to be effective in the global budget setting. However, in Ontario currently, it's a mixed payment loss model to hospitals. So right now in Ontario, they use um, an analog to a diagnosis related groups called quality-based procedures, where there's a per patient, per patient based payment. And they use this for about 30 different conditions. And I think in those instances, where the hospital's remuneration is directly tied to the quality of care, it's certainly much more feasible in a province such as Ontario. However, I'm a little skeptical of whether or not they would work in Ontario even because it is unlinked to physician-based remuneration. So that means that the, the, the surgeons and or the hospitalists involved in the patient's care, their payment is unlinked with the quality of care that they provide. So my personal opinion is that you would need to integrate the physician incentives, positive and negative, for the kind of care that one would want to receive at a hospital. And I think currently the only setting where that's feasible is in Ontario where they have the backbone and the infrastructure to be able to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, we have another question from Rita, who just rolled in. Uh, saying, what are your thoughts about bringing long-term care into the Canada Health Act? Any key learnings from other countries? Well, two big questions. And I, I, I think, you know, there is... So first off, you know, I have a lot of thoughts and probably could fill a book about this. And certainly there's a lot of policy debate ongoing about whether or not long-term care should be part of the Health Act. Now, my personal opinion is it would be great to see long-term care incorporated into the Canada Health Act because then it would ensure a universality of access to some kind of health uh, long-term care. But that is separate from the issue of what kind of long-term care they would receive. It's separate from the issue of financing. It's separate also from the infrastructure and the tax points associated with doing all of these things. I mean, uh, supporting financially a massive expansion needed, in my opinion, of long-term care is going to cost a lot of money. And right now, dealing with the post-COVID effects of provincial governments are not feeling all that flush with cash. So I'm not all that optimistic unless the federal government weighs in with billions of dollars to reform the delivery system and to amend the Canada Health Act. However, I would also at the same time say that is it the long-term care sector that needs to be brought into the Canada Health Act or is it health in general? So that, that would reflect eye care, dental care, drugs, all of these other important sectors of the healthcare system that are either commercially insured through employers or privately paid out of pocket. So if we're going to ensure health, which is maybe the model some countries are pursuing, then we should think about a holistic perspective of health, including mental health care, which is sorely needed. I, I'm just not clear that long-term care is first 
on there. Uh, and I'm not sure what, the, if we were to open it up, I don't know what would be first, but I, I would like to see what the evidence around the different sectors are, because right now there's no consensus. The, the governments over the last 10 years have been debating without resolution, the inclusion of drugs into the Healthcare Act, but there's currently no platform for even doing drugs. So it seems I'm a little skeptical, although I'm a huge proponent in expanding the basket myself, the public basket of insured services. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, there are two more questions and there are a few minutes left. So maybe I'll just take one of them. Uh, so Caleb asked, how do you think increased digitalization of medical records will help or hinder the effect of silos? Or is the fundamental problem still a question of incentives? Well, I don't think it's an or, I think it's a, a both kind of an answer. Um, Currently, Canada is far behind in the terms of the integration of medical records. I mean, I'll draw two provincial examples. I know there are a lot of people on this call from British Columbia and Ontario. So in British Columbia, the government through the public um, or through PHSA, the Provincial Health Services Authority, is funding over a billion dollars to roll out an integrated medical record for hospital-based care. So that's a, that's a billion dollar investment over several years, but it is not going to go into primary care. So it still leaves all of the primary care docs with no means to communicate in an effective and integrated way with specialty care and hospital-based care as well. So. I see us being a long ways from that. And if I look east into Ontario, where I do a lot of my work, it's a highly fragmented market with a number of IT vendors with, um, with um, somewhat integrated delivery systems. So if you're up at Trillium, maybe there's an electronic medical record that follows you from the hospital sector into the affiliated hospitals and their long-term care sector and the true the same might be true down in Hamilton as well but but for the large part in Ontario it's a highly fragmented market and you know having the a single integrated medical record is still years if not at least a decade away so i'm a little skeptical there because there's not a major push to really prioritize the integration um, of all of these needed subsystems to be able to talk to one another and this belies the fact that in the United States, a number of states have set up very effective health information exchanges where all healthcare providers provide a limited data set at linked at the individual level. So even if you're in a different health system with a different healthcare provider, a minimum subset of data is there to tell you what that patient's receiving care for, what drugs they're taking, who's providing that care but we can't even get our act together to set up health information exchanges in, in Canadian provinces. So I'm a little bit um, um, jaded with response uh, in that sector right now. Thank you very much uh, for that and for the presentation and for being with us here today. Um, we're out of time now, so um, I'd just like to Thank all of our viewers for coming. Thank you, Dr. Sutherland, for being here today. And um, just to remind all of you that we have a half an hour break now, and then we have another session at, at 12 o'clock. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and, and have a great day, and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.